start. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for coming. I know it's not easy to be here at this time on Sunday. Um, it is my honor to um, preside this panel. My name is Ramon Fonkwe, and I am from Michigan Technological University, where I teach literature and cultural studies in the Department of Humanities. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to be um, introducing um, presenters at, as their turn come. Our first, I think I'm looking at the wrong page. Great, got it right now. Our first presenter is Okol, Okel, correct me if I pronounce it wrong, Okelo Ogwan from Makere University in Uganda. Is she, is she here? No, not yet. So then we are going to jump to the second um, presentation, which is entitled Repositioning Nigerian Musicology in the 21st Century, Development, Existing Social Realities, and the Imagined Future, by Babatunji Olusei Dada from the University of Ibadan. So I'm going to pass the floor on to you. Thank you. I'm sorry, introduce all of them. I'm going to do as they. Okay. Oh, no, I'm giving you the wrong. Okay. All right. So where do I click this? Flip it somewhere on the chair. Okay. In, um, Nigerian musicology in the 21st century, the past, the current state and trends, and the way forward. By the way, the, it's, it's an ongoing um, research, so it's still in pretty much a draft form. Musicology has been defined as the scholarly or scientific study of music, as in historical research, musical theory, or the physical nature of sound. Basically, musicology in its um, simplest um, form is uh, the science of music. In the same way that biology is the science of life, I mean, is the scientific study of life, musicology can be seen as simply a scientific study of music. Now, historically, musicology as a field of study can be traced to the pioneering work of scientists, philosophers, and clergymen from different periods. Starting from the antique era, these men include the likes of uh, Aristotelus, um, 355 BC, Pythagoras, um, 571 BC or thereabout, Boesus, and men like that. The efforts of these earlier theories were further advanced by those of the medieval era, including the lights of Egido of Arezzo, uh, Bartholomew, and all that. These early proponents formulated models from which emerged the Western classical music. The philosophical conceptualizations not only helped to establish, but also to preserve and propagate Western classical music across different generations and also to project it into its global limelight. Now, the focus of this paper is not on Western um, musicology. It is actually on Nigerian musicology. And Nigerian musicology, not in the sense of the study of Western music in Nigeria, but in the sense of the study of um, music of Nigerian origin by Nigerian scholars. Music as a universal phenomenon features um, specific and normative standards that vary significantly across different ethnic and national borders. I mean, a lot of our frontline um, music African musicologists have, um, have said a lot on this. Mekin Zewi said there are distinctive sonic characteristics and creative intentions that are peculiar to the musical sound 
of cultural areas and regions. This view is echoed by many of our um, Nigerian, frontline Nigerian musicologists. This paper is, is uh, to drive home its points, it's, uh, there is a theory that is involved. Um, it's the theory of um, continuity and change as uh, propounded by Bascom and Ascovitz. They use this theory in their explanation of African co yeah, continuity and change in African culture. Now, music definitely has a lot of bearing with culture and in Africa, of course, this is Nigerian musicology, so definitely this theory was chosen to help um, drive home the point of this paper. Now, here's a brief historical narrative of musicology in Nigeria. There's no exact date that could be fixed as the commencement of um, the musicologic study in Nigeria. But a lot of musicologists, a lot, a lot of our scholars have agreed that somewhere, um, somewhere in the middle of the 19th century, due to the pioneering works of the early missionaries um, and the colonial masters, music was introduced into the curriculum, though not in a solid way, but somehow was introduced into the curriculum, and understandably so, but to help the people that were coming in contact for the very first time with um, European Christian um, religion to understand the music, which plays a very, very critical role in the liturgical process of, in the liturgical processes. As a, as a subject of study in the IR institution, of course it was introduced in Nigeria in 1961 in the University of Nigeria Unsuka. Now, I also briefly try to speak about different generations of musicologists or musicologist scholars in Nigeria, at which I try to divide them into different generations. Now, the first generations, which belong to the pre-independence um, era, by the way, Nigeria obtained its independence in 1960. This first generation of scholars, um, they include the likes of T.K. Phillips and um, Fela Shawande. This people had the initial contact with the colonial um, um, masters then, and they were taught directly by these people, and they, they were the first person, they made the first known attempts at theorizing Nigerian music. And of course, goes on to the second generation. These ones are the post-independence generation of scholars. Um, these ones uh, included, um, this actually included the fraud fruits of the Nigerian institution of um, music scholarship. They include the likes of Mekin Zewi, Samakpabot, Tunji Vidal, Musumala Omibi Yobidike, and Laze Kwame. And on and on, there's a third generation, and of course, it goes on to a fourth generation that I call the millennial generation. These are the generations that, that came after the turn of the millennium. Now, also, in this paper, I try to look at what I call intellectual revolution challenging the status quo. Now, based on the hypothetical classification of Nigerian musicologists that I just mentioned, this phenomenon occurred around the time of the second generation of scholars. Five more minutes, thank you. Around the, um, is that my, sorry. Where is it? Sorry about that. Is it music? <laughs> I've got to reject that call. Okay, there was this intellectual um, um, revolution in which this generation of scholars, they rose up and challenged what the first generation um, came up with. Their idea was that the first generation was trying to use theories based on Western standards to interpret or to explain um, Nigerian music. It just came as a wave of intellectual um, revolution. And uh, I, I, one of our scholars actually called this a kind of a, a, a movement of um, 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 pan-Africanism, whereas this second generation came up and said, well, we can continue to explain our music of Nigeria by using Western theories and Western standards. 
So there was something like that um, um, looked at in this, in this paper. And of course, this paper also went on to look at what are the challenges that are actually facing musicology in Nigeria, because the title says repositioning musicology in Nigeria. And it talked about a lexicographical lacuna. That's, that, that, there's something, there's a problem about how do Africans identify typical um, phenomena in Nigerian music? How would they explain them? Because before now, the theories that were available were theories that were based on Western music. So our scholars have a challenge of explaining how do we, ex uh, how, how do we theorize phenomena in Nigeria? How can we explain it without using Western standards, Western, um, already established Western theories that a lot of these scholars have discovered could not really explain the concepts that we can find in African music. Then there is the problem of um, which, I call, which I call the politics of uh, nomenclature. A lot of um, African schol Nigerian scholars now have this problem of actually agreeing on what words to use. What words do we use to even call what we are studying? Some say it is African musicology. Some call it um, ethnomusicology. Some will say it is pure musicology. Among our frontline scholars, there's also that challenge of what words, what tags do we use to um, explain what we are studying. And of course, this paper ranks up by, by recommending that there should be a form of um, better collaboration and cooperation between the frontline scholars to agree on some of these basic issues. And also, Nigerian scholars of music should work towards a form of um, scientific standards. Now the challenge we have in African music is that a lot of the phenomenon cannot be explained scientifically. We cannot use scientific standards that are available in Western music to explain a lot of the phenomena that are available in Af Nigerian music. They just say, well, it, this, this, this happens and they are not empirical um, standards used to measure the things that happen in African music. So one of the suggestions of this um, paper is that it would be better if Nigerian musicologists also look at science just like Western music was established, Western musicology was established based on science, scientific standards. There are specific measurements that mean specific things. There are empirical measurements that have uh, specific standards. And if Africans too, and in this case Nigerians, can look at this, it will help position the field of Nigerian musicology on a better stage worldwide. And in this stage of globalization, it will help position the music of Nigeria on a better world stage, better for integration, better for propagation, and better for analysis and study. Thank you very much. I'm a scholar artist. That means I'm a professional actress and a lecturer. The title of my paper is um, From Lecture Hall to Practice. Sustainable Development in the Training of Acting in Nigerian Tertiary Institutions, Olabisi Onobanjo University, and Pencils, where I teach. One as a, um, as a, as a the first one, Olabisi Onobanjo University is my place of work, and sometimes I do adjunct lecturing at uh, Pencils. The, the objective of the paper is to talk about the necessity for training, especially in the arts of acting. Acting we call thespian artistry, right? How do we come about calling it thespian? Thespian was the first actor in history that came out to say, I am uh, thespis. I'm going to play Shongo. I'm going to play this. I'm going to play that. So everybody uh, who are actors, we call them thespians. So the paper, the purpose of this paper is to, is to talk about the necessity for training. So the paper is going to be discussed in three parts. The first one is um, training. The second one, I'll talk about the practice. And the third one, I'll talk about the sustainability of the acting in the Nigerian movie industry. The first one is training, which is very, very important. We will realize that in whatever one finds uh, we, we, wherever you find your hands to do, 
it is very, very important that you add training to your talents. Even though we mean that uh, in thespian artistry, you must have talents, at least 50%, before you can train. And uh, what do we mean by this talents? Talents is described as a, a way that you practice whatever you are doing perfectly with ease. It is natural. You cannot really define it, but it is recognizable in you, right? Part of the attributes of talent is being electric, being magnetic, and having stage presence, right? So talent is there, but talent not refined is just like a raw gold that you have that is not refined. Uh, and unrefined gold is not usable for anybody. So if you have a talent and you do not back it up with training, uh, it is very, very useless. So the objective of the paper is to explore the need for training and the alternate continuum in practice towards skill acquisition. I'm talking about talent and I'm talking about the training. In the training of acting, it is different because here I talk about the curriculum in Olabisi Onobanjo University and I talk about the curriculum in pencils. In Olabisi Onobanjo University, we cannot achieve much there because the students of acting major have to participate and to go for other lectures, unlike the Pencils Film Institute, where that one is a commercial film school. Where there, it's a three-month course. You do everything in three months. You don't have any other interest in any other subject except acting. So it has uh, yielded a lot of fruits, unlike Olabisi Onobanjo University. Remember, I'm talking about the training, and I'm talking about the curricula of the two schools. So the curriculum in Olabisi Onobanjo University is not so good because students are, uh, are not so much focused in it. In the two, there are certain uh, courses, there are certain disciplines, and there are certain issues we talk about in the curriculum of acting. First, we talk about the physical exercises, we talk about the speech, and we talk about the creative exercises. What do we mean by physical exercises? Physical exercises are the ex exercises that you do to your body to tone up your body, your muscles, and all that. The speech exercises are the articulation and the, well, voice exercises that you need to be able to express yourself on stage and in front of the camera. For the creative exercises, these are the exercises that you do to be able to uh, stimulate your creative essence so that when you are being given a part to do, all those exercises come together to form a kind of training. So the training ground, you remember the title of this thing is From Lecture Hall to Practice. The training of acting that you have had helps you a lot in being able to model yourself, to develop a concept, to develop a brand, to develop a model, to develop a style of acting. There are some people, they have particular ways of doing things. Or what they are doing, what they are expressing, have undergone training in different areas. Now the practice. When you are talking about the practice of acting, there are, basic, uh, there are basically two methods in which you can practice. Um, we, we engage the theories of Konstantin Stanislavski, right? He was a theorist in acting, even though he's, um, he has evolutionized in that. And we talk about uh, Bertolt Brecht. In Konstantin Stanislavski, his style of acting is what is called realistic acting. Sometimes they call it inside out. What do we mean by this? Basically, what Konstantin Stanislavski is talking about, remember, even in Pencils Film Institute and Olabisi Onobanjo University, this basic training of acting is almost the same. We are talking about the out output now, which is very unfortunate in Olabisi Onobanjo University. Yes, to continue with the, three, uh, with the theories of Konstantin Stanislavski. In the theory, it says that if you have to show sorrow, if you have to show fear, you have to remember what happened to you before. For example, if you have to express um, sorrow, one can remember at a particular point in time of your life that you experienced something like that. And so you go into yourself. Sometimes some technicians call this method inside out. That is, you think from inside and you express outside. So it is called inside out. It is called presentational method. Why is it presentational? Because 
you present life as it is. It is realistic. The second method is bottle to breast. For bottle breast, he believes that uh, he uses what is called alienation effect. What is this alienation effect? You alienate yourself from the character, right? You, uh, uh, Brecht will tell you that it is not real. It is illusionistic. It is all a game. So when you are on stage, you tell the people that it is not real. So if you have to express joy, sadness, you do it from outside in. Remember, uh, Konstantin Stanislavski says inside out. For Bertolt Brecht, he says outside in. So that is don't feel it at all. There was a time I had a show in Germany. When we were entering, we saw all these actresses. They came out in their costume. And I would say, hello, how are you? I'm playing Petronella, I'm playing John, so that when you see them on stage, you don't get carried away. That is the style of um, Bertolt Brecht, alienation effect. For Konstantin Stanislavski, it is um, affective memory, or what is called emotional recall. You recall from your memory. That is the practice of acting. Even though we have other styles, but all other styles come under these two major theories, and that is Konstantin Stanislavski and Bartosz Brecht. In Nigeria, most of the time we go through um, Konstantin Stanislavski, which is a realistic acting, all the time. For uh, Bartosz Brecht, it is only professionals that can get away with that. Because if you are not... Okay, okay. Now let me go to the sustainability. Because after all this training, after all this practice, you need very, very importantly to be able to sustain yourself in this industry. Without which, if you do not adhere to the ethics of the profession, you may find yourself uh, in a kind of a loophole. <coughs> Excuse me. There are certain things, I, I name it ethics for sustainability in the industry. One, you must have a sense of professionalism. That is, in whatever you do, you know that you're a professional, right? Every other thing does not matter except that profession. You must develop what is called a passion for your job. Complete passion for your job. Any other thing does not matter. That is why we say that in the theater, the show must go on. If my mother dies today and I have a show today, I must perform. The show comes first because you cannot go and tell the audience that, uh, please, my mother is dying, I just have to give you this show and I have to go back. No, they're paid. They have to stone you. Right. Then temperament. <coughs> However, somebody says that if you are crazy, hide it. You don't need to display craziness when you are on stage. Our stage is our world. Whether you are temperamental, whether you are the person that is um, comic, whether you are very, very, you have attitude and all that, it does not really matter. There are cases when I have to act with somebody who I had quarrels with. When we are on, on stage, he will carry me as a lover. Hello, my dear, and all that. Immediately, light goes off, you just drop me like a hot charcoal. But then, when light comes up again, we smile and all that. You must not let any temperament disturb your acting. And of course, you know acting is, a, is an all-round artistry, right? It is cerebral, right? It is visual, it is interpretative, it is creative. So if anything disturbs it in terms of temperament, you may not be able to achieve it, right? Then we talk about versatility. You must be versatile. If you restrict yourself to being a, a, a stock character, uh, okay, I play only comic roles, you will not sell. You have reduced your market value. You must be able to be versatile. And uh, I was talking with my brother this morning, and I discovered that I have to add this to it. Uh, in terms of language, you must be versatile in the language of your communication, right? Your indigenous language and any other language of your communication. If it is Yoruba, I have to be very, very fluent in my language. If it is English, I have to be very, very fluent in it because when you have to think about the way you have to speak, it may disturb your expression. Acting is strictly cerebral, right? We talk about the discipline and ad adaptability. In any area that you find yourself in terms of performance, you must be disciplined. There are cases where you have to travel out and uh, some people have hangovers, they drink too much. There was a case that we went to Ife to perform and one of the people there were just, uh, you know, strolling all about, he ju she just got drunk. And so the person who took us there said, well, you will not perform on stage. Joker, please take the script. In 30 minutes, I got the lines and I performed. She was sanctioned. And 
uh, as a director, you will not touch that person from a mile off because you know that whenever you go somewhere, because the director, your, your producer, sees you in terms of the financial uh, whatever. So if you are a bad market, you are a bad market that you will not sell. For you to be a professional actress, to be able to sustain yourself in the industry, you must have discipline and you must have adaptability. You just don't go to any area, you eat too much, and you start going to the toilet. What if you have a show? <laughs> then, <laughs> or you find wine, you find this, you take everything at the same time, or you just sleep off. There was a case of a, a popular Nigerian actress. We were at a location. She saw palm wine, and said, so she drank. Her. And we had to shoot a marketplace which comes up 21 days after. So she could not do it. So we had to wait for 21 days. So you can see the financial implication on the part of the director. So next time, the director will not touch that actor. We are talking about sustainability in the market, right? Other collaborators, you need to have good relationship with other actors. No matter what, if you are crazy, I say it, you must hide it. You can display craziness anywhere, but when you are on stage, you have to be everybody's friend. So that because the success of one person is the success of another, right? So generally, uh, when you are having training of acting, it has grounded you. It has grounded you to have a kind of outlook in your job. Then we talk about the uh, team spirit. You must have team spirit, just like the football team. And I say, the success of one person is the success of the other. If you fail, every other person fails because you cannot act in isolation. You act together. So you must develop that team spirit. So thank you very much and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter to you all. I want to say that uh, I'm not Taiwo Fawahini. I am Ola Rewaju. Cecilia Abiodu. No. Uh, she's a colleague. She's not able to make it to the conference, and she has asked. Incidentally, my own area is different from this, but I will try to do just do the best. Uh, hey, I just want to give that preamble so that you will understand. The title of the paper is Perspective in Education and Development. The abstract, linguistic communities communities seem to always want to aspire towards one form of development or the other. This is to say societies tend towards change. To this end, this paper attempts to examine the place and impact of education on issues on development. Actually, the input of language, culture, and technology in this regard may not be overemphasized. Our findings reveal that when educational goals are geared towards the right direction, the society experiences a positive political, social, cultural, and economic development. On the other hand, a faulty education system brings about a breakdown in societal growth. This given the fact that individuals or groups which make up for a society pass through one form of education or the other, be it a formal or an informal type in a bid to allow for development. The introduction, what is education? Who is educated? How is he educated? These all are paramount questions asked consciously or unconsciously in virtually all linguistic communities. Individuals and groups in the society aspire towards being educated, while the society may try to offer the former or informal type of education. The focus being development, as no society may wish to remain static without a change in a considerable period of time. This is why this, the paper has viewed it necessary to consider some educational goals alongside development in the society, educational goals and development. The word education in itself is very complex. This is because so many scholars have attempted to attribute to the term various definitions. In UNESCO paper on quality education, Satish Kumar and Sajjad Hamad made a collection of various views of some great educators on this subject matter. Education is a manifestation of perfection already in man. Like fire in a piece of flint, knowledge exists in the mind. Suggestion is the friction which brings it out. The highest education is that which does not merely give its information but makes our life in harmony with all existence. Education is something which makes a man 
self-reliant and selfless. Education develops in the body and soul of the pupil all the beauty and all the perfection is capable of. Education is the creation of sound mind in a sound body. It develops means faculty, especially his mind, so that he may be able to enjoy the con contemplation of supreme truth, goodness, and beauty. Education is the child's development from within. Education is the enfoldment of what, it, what is already unfolded in the gem. It is the process through which the child makes the internal external. Education is the development of good moral character. Education is not a preparation for life, rather it is the living. Education is the process of living through a continuous reconstruction of experiences. It is the development of all these capacities in the individual which will enable him to control his environment and fulfill his possibilities. The last of the definitions appears to give a summary of all. Education can be termed as a process of change which affects the whole of man's existence. What then are the goals, the specific goals of education? Irina Borova, UNESCO, states that in April 2000, at the World Education Forum in Dakar, Senegal, the international community reaffirmed its commitments to achieve education for all, this time 2015, with the following six specific goals. One, expanding and improving comprehensive early childhood care and education, especially for the most vulnerable and disadvantaged children. Two, ensuring that by 2015, all children, particularly girls, children in difficult circumstances, and those belonging to ethnic minorities have access to and complete free and compulsory primary education in good quality. Ensuring that the learning needs of all young people and adults are met through equitable access to appropriate learning and life skills programs. Achieving that the, four, achieving that the learning needs of all young people and adult literacy by 2015, especially for women, and equitable access to basic and continuing education for all adults. Five, eliminating gender disparities in primary and secondary education by 2005 and achieving gender, gender equality in education by 2015 with a focus on ensuring girls full and equal access to achievement in basic education of good quality. Six, improving all aspects of the quality of education and ensuring excellence of all so that recognized and measurable learning outcomes are achieved by all, especially in literacy, numeracy, and essential life skills. The above highlighted goals are all geared towards development in the world as a whole, and most especially in each of the nations in particular. From Akorede's viewpoint, development means change Therefore, true development should reflect positive changes in the community. It would involve the unfolding and realization of man's creative potentials. Such changes enable people to improve their material conditions of living through the use of resources available to them. Thus, if educational goals, as mentioned above, are geared towards the right direction, we then talk of a positive development or better still, a sustainable development. The United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development in 1987 gave the following definition. Development is sustainable if it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Societies around the globe will rather opt for a sustainable development in terms of education policies. This is because policies made without adequate consideration of the younger and rather the future generations are made in isolation. Such policies would only enter into the vacuum when the set of people it is only meant for are no more relevant to the society. We are using Nigeria as an example on policies on education, language and policies on education. Language is of vital importance to all areas of development in the society. Eliot, 1963, opines that language is intimately connected with activities, desires, 
emotions, thoughts, and all the business of life. And to confirm this, Oshisawo 2003 views that a breakdown of communication often leads to misunderstanding, suspicion, and lack of trust. Thus, language is indispensable to a development. In fact, it is the two par excellence through which education builds development. In another parlance, World Work 1980 states the following as functions of language. I want to, the culture an instrument for educational development. People often think culture to be the unique, interesting, or odd behavior of some group of people united by the same language. Farah in 2012 opines that culture consists not only of behaviors and practices, but also of deeply held beliefs about what is right, appropriate, and acceptable, and what is wrong and wrong, inappropriate, and unacceptable. The use of proverbs. Proverbs over the years have been a very rich source of educating both the young and the old in the traditional African society. Amodu 2009 points that African proverbs reflect African philosophical wisdom. Any exercise in the interpretation of Yoruba proverbs will indicate that Yoruba proverbs are communicative of philosophy of life. Proverbs are especially meant to shape the lifestyle of the individual, as well as bring peace and tra tranquility to the community at large. The table below, I will just read some proverbs and their interpretation, maybe one or two that she has here. Friend of many, friend of none. It is good to have more than one anchor on a ship. The above categories of proverbs are used in times of encouragement and admonition. Proverbs are intricately woven to the culture and education of the people. Other examples are Ijakumok, Konirin Nyoso, Enitia Bire, Konirin Nyoru. Is it Ijakumo? Sorry, Ijakumo. Konirin Nyoso, Enitia Bire, Konirin Nyoru. Eagles don't breed doves. Ogede dudu ko ya bu son, omo buruku ko ya alupa. Each one is a craftsman of his or his own fortune. This, we can't translate it just like that. Hey. But what he's saying is that you are the architect of your destiny. Rhymes and aura, I will just jump because of the time. The use of rhymes and oral poetry had been the means by excellence whereby the traditional African setting educated its inhabitants through the informal educational system. In modern day education, rhymes and poetry are found in subjects such as literature, social studies, civic education, and the like. The table below, she has some tables too. I'll just read one. Matthew Wuro Sheri Ore Murasi Sheo John Lo. Make he while the sun shines. I make hay. It's hay. Make hay while the sun shines. She went on to talk about music and talking drums, moonlight stories and folk tales and taboos, development through technology in education. And conclusion. Development, however minute or slow, is constant to all linguistic societies. This is because human beings everywhere aspire for change. Education, on the other hand, complements development because both the formal and informal type of education contribute to development in any community. To this end, societies around the globe aspire to create educational goals, which also is subject to change from time to time. Thank you. So today, don't be fooled by the big title. Uh, basically, all I'm talking about is maps, uh, maps of Africa. Um, I, as a graduate student, I've recently completed my PhD. And a huge problem that I have as a history student was the historical maps of Africa and being able to locate uh, you know, what is behind the modern day boundaries of many countries, 
uh, specifically from political context, but also ethnic context as well. So I've kind of come across um, you know, several problems with, with this major issue, I think, in the historical maps of Africa. So what I'm going to hopefully do is just talk to you about uh, one particular region, which is sort of Yoruba focused, uh, and to kind of go out from there, look at kind of the whole historiography of maps in, in a matter of 10 minutes. So it's a pretty big task, but I think I'll be able to do it. And talk to you about some of the theoretical solutions that I've sort of come up with, not only in terms of a short term, but also a long term solutions. So I think this is really important because in terms of teaching Africa, uh, having very good maps about Africa will help in the instruction uh, of what is behind Africa, what is the history of Africa. And I also think it can lead to the development of new curricula uh, from you know, elementary school level all the way up through university. So when we look at old maps of Africa, uh, you know, for the most part, these are made by Europeans. Uh, you know, this one was made by Leo Africanus, if you're not familiar. And you know, he, he gathered a lot of information from places he's never actually been. And this sort of became a standard of Africa for you know, 250 years. So a major issue was you know, no one, the European cart cartographic technologies didn't really reach the interior until the late 18th century. So on this particular map from 1798, uh, you know, they haven't figured out where the Niger River goes. Uh, so it, it's actually going straight across Africa and connecting to the Nile. So even by 1798, they really didn't have any idea of the internal geography of Africa. So by about the 1820s, this is where we get European and Muslim cartography actually intersecting. So this is uh, Muhammad Bello's map of the Sokoto Caliphate and different uh, kingdoms within the region. So he's actually showing the, the bend in the Niger River and this is where we're starting to get kind of this intersection of, of, of cartography. But this is only happening by the 1820s. So of course when we get into kind of the colonial period, this is Samuel Johnson's map, and he starts getting into more detail, and this is, this is where things are, are starting to happen in terms of cartography, understanding where specific places exist at specific points in time. But there's still a lot of problems because you know, by 1921, Old Oyo has long been destroyed, and yet this appears on this map. So now we're having these conflicts of places that don't exist, but had existed on a single map. So there's sort of, there's a lot of inconsistency. So as we get into the colonial period, and, you know, history starts emerging as a, as a field of study, and Europeans are taking interest in it, we, we start getting, you know, these historical reconstructions of what the geography looked like in the past. Um, but the problem with some of these maps is that they don't have a specific time period attached to them. So we don't know whether this is from 1500, 1600. So we can see things like the old boundary and the present boundary, but we don't have any dates attached to these particular issues. So moving on, you know, um, when history is really s kind of solidified as its own field post-World War II, um, we, we start getting maps that are showing modern day boundaries, talking about historical context. So now, you know, Nigeria didn't exist in the pre-colonial period, so now we have these major issues of students looking at these maps, trying to understand what's behind the modern day boundaries and not being able to kind of fully conceptualize what's, what's happening. So certain historians, such as J.D. Fage, he uh, started putting together kind of a, a historical atlas of Africa. And this is where we start to get images of these kind of before and after pictures of what's happening within the West African context. So we see Oyo, uh, Nupe, the Hausa states, before they amalgamated into the Sokoto Caliphate. You know, Ashanti. 
And then sort of the after is, here's what he calls the Fulani Empire. So we're still getting some kind of historical inaccuracies that need to be addressed at the same time. So as histori the history of Africa has been developing and developing, we, we get more and more detailed maps with specific dates and spe specific periods, such as Robin Law's map of the Oyo Empire at its greatest extent, which is in 1780. And so on this map, these are all towns, some of which still exist today, some of them don't. Um, but the, the problem with this is that we get highly fragmented regions of Africa. So we can't really see the neighboring groups beyond what's there. So it's sort of a lot of what I started looking at was trying to piece together what's, what are the connections between the neighboring groups, neighboring kingdoms at different periods of time, which has sort of led to you know, my, my short-term solution, which is to kind of recreate, this is a map I made, of uh, taking Robin Law's map, but building out from it to see different historical contexts, the different towns. Now, of course, this is incredibly important. I'm trained as an Atlantic historian, so my, a lot of my interest is working with the slave trade and being, under, being able to understand when towns are forming, when they're dissolving through war and conflict will help us understand who is boarding slave ships and where they're going in the Americas. So <clears throat> here, here are sort of a series of three maps that I've been playing with. This is, again, just my short-term solution. But this is sort of the Bight of Benin hinterland in, in, a, in circa 1580, where Oyo is actually in a period of decline. Uh, the Benin kingdom is, is in a period of expansion. And so by 1780, the, the, the region has completely transformed because political boundaries are constantly moving in and out over periods of time. And so, of course, then by 1850, the same region looks entirely different. And so, just even with these simple visualizations, I think, in terms of educating about Africa, it becomes very, very uh, illustrative. So we're using data analysis. Um, so the long-term solution, because now, of course, we're getting into a world of historical GIS, is creating the infrastructure that would be able to be plotted onto a series of chronological maps. So this involves creating databases with periodizations. So we know from the historiography that, you know, Oyo Ile was, through archaeological studies, we know that walls have been dated to circa 810. Um, it was destroyed in about 1500. And then it was refounded where it had entered its imperial period from 1600 to 1836, where it was destroyed again by the, the Fulani Jihad. So, and that, at about that time, Sokoto is sort of established as a town, and it still exists today. So this is just sort of the basic structure of what a database would look like in terms of the toponyms. Now, we multiply this by how many towns, and we're getting into massive big data. So what we would end up having is sort of a series of, of databases that would be connected by a number that we would assign to a specific place, whether it exists today or not. And through this, we'd be able to integrate, create boundary polygons, put them onto a series of chronological maps. So what we're kind of anticipating is having a map per day for the centuries. Um, of course, we, we have the slave trade database, which is already a massive database with over 36,000 individual voyages that have been documented and organized. So we, could, we would be able, since we know place of departure, we would be able to link slave ships up to the specific ports of embarkation. And then in time, the map might grow to broader world regions, so we would be able to see departures and arrivals also start to be able to map out where slave uprisings are happening in the Americas and really be able to look at the entire African diaspora throughout the world, so hence global Africa. Um, so a major problem with this is cost. Um, this is sort of, GIS is not particularly cheap. Um, so this is really, you know, in this theoretical uh, approach that I'm doing, um, I'm 
a lot of the problem is sort of building in sustainability into a project of this magnitude, because um, this, obviously this project is not tiny. Uh, we need to get input from African universities. Extremely, extremely important. Um, it's not just a, a one-person project. It's going to be a collaboration. Um, it's, it, the platform, it would be online, uh, where it would, could be open sourced, uh, where we're going to get input from people crowdsourcing, integrating African archives. Um, I've spoken to some people like Ismael Montana, the University of Guelph, uh, who talks to me about archives in Kaduna that have lists of towns that existed and have been destroyed. So integrating all of this data, creating the massive database, to build the, the infrastructure behind it and raise awareness for a project. Thank you very much. Is it loud enough? It will be loud enough. It's the camera. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, sure. Okay. So you have 12 minutes for your presentation. Okay, don't worry. I'll just take about seven. Okay. Yeah. Seven. <laughs> um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and happy Easter once again. Um, this paper is titled Human Rights in Africa's Underdevelopment, Contextualizing the Trajectory of a Continent in Captivity. Um, I'm just going to read out uh, a little bit here for like two minutes and I will explain. The African continent is noted for its conflicts, bad governance, illiteracy and corruption. However, these negative notorieties do not fully capture or highlight the enormous potentials which the continent possesses. That Africa is rich is no news. What is news, however, is the failure of African leaders, past and present, to effectively harness these resources to Africa's advantage. Added to the above, is the issue of human rights, which in no small way have limited the potentials and productivity of Africans in so many ways. First is the limited availability of opportunities for human capacity development. Second is the constant and consistent violation of the rights of citizens by various African governments. Third is a lack of adequate institutional framework to tackle the problems. It is the position of this paper that there is a nexus, um, there's a, a nexus between the respect for human rights and development. The systemic hiccups, broken governments, and general underdevelopment in Africa can be traced to the incessant disrespect for human rights. This paper believes that the social contract between the citizenry and government must be symbiotic in nature within the context of mutual respect and dignity. On the whole, the paper examines in detail the trajectory of an African continent in socioeconomic and political captivity by the same leaders entrusted with the responsibility of its emancipation. Now, when you hear captivity, of course, you would remember the slavery days. You remember, you know, colonialism and all that. But my problem with that is that the blame game is overflogged. We need to begin to take responsibility for our actions and our problems. Of course, bad things happened in the past. But now, we are the problems ourselves. Because after over 60 years of independence, you know, in most African countries, we need to really pick up the pieces and begin to believe in ourselves and move forward. Now, what this paper looks at is, you know, the, the, the connection between human rights and underdevelopment. And you know, if you don't allow people to fully exhibit their potentials and to uh, believe that they can contribute as stakeholders to a system, of course, they will be party to destroying it. Because if you don't believe that you have something to benefit or gain 
from a system, then it doesn't matter what happens to that system. And I think this is the mentality and the mindset of majority of Africans. And most of African leaders, majority of them, do not believe that citizens are stakeholders. It is you know, a, a rentier situation where they are the landlords and we are the tenants. But unfortunately, they are supposed to be holding brief for us because we have ceded our rights to govern ourselves and allow them to govern us. But that trust has been broken. There is a disconnect between the symbiotism of give and take. And that is where we have missed it. And it bothers me when Africans, you know, African leaders begin to run around the world looking for foreign aid. Africa don't need no foreign aid. Africa has been a blessing to the world. Africa has been raped for so many years, forced by colonial masters, and now presently by new colonialist Africans who do not see anything good in themselves and the African continent. And I think this is the problem. But this paper is very critical about this situation. And it recommends a lot of things. First, we must begin to enforce our laws properly. We must begin to pull these people behind bars. Because if, you know, the, the only way you can guarantee, uh, you know, effective, um, uh, uh, you know, effectiveness in the society is that people begin to, should begin to know that once they do the wrong things, they will be punished for it. And uh, I see a lot of hope, though. Uh, you know, it sounds pessimistic, but there is a lot of hope. And I think the new generation, the younger generation, need to actually, uh, you know, be the ones that would pilot the situation. We don't need to run away from Africa or from our problems, but we need to begin to really believe in Africa. And uh, that's where the diaspora comes in. But we must create the enabling environment to come for them to come and help us uh, by enforcing human rights uh, issues and, uh, you know, begin to move forward. Thank you very much. My name is Dick Rula Adewale Yagbo Yaju. Um, I'm a professor of political science from the University of Ibadan. Uh, before the questions, a quick uh, observation. Uh, I would like to send this note of caution, uh, particularly to most um, presenters by proxy. Um, it is certainly not sufficient for us to uh, present on behalf of colleagues if we are not sufficiently um, familiar with the paper. Um, Dan Fulani from Kaduna State University did so well yesterday yeah. by presenting on behalf of another person, yet presenting so well. It's, it's very simple to understand. He familiarized himself uh, with the paper that he presented. My questions uh, for Fadi Rikbo. Um, I would like to know if um, there are unions and how effective they are for theater practitioners in Nigeria, uh, particularly with respect to the predictability of most of your um, uh, most of your scripts. Most of the time, viewers are able to predict the conclusion right from the beginning, except, except, and with due regard, except for most of uh, the cinemas and most of the films produced by pencils. I guess pencils uh, is the um, bring behind super story. Yeah. So I would like to know what the union in Nigeria is doing to this. Maybe it's as a result of the fact that most, with the regard, most, um, most Nigerians get involved in different vocations now as a last resort. As a last resort, when there's no other uh, thing to do, they decide to uh, jump into. Then um, the second question uh, for the presentation on abuse of uh, human rights, incessant abuse of human rights. 
I wonder what the theoretical framework of analysis is for that presentation. You uh, so much emphasized state dysfunctionality, state failure, state fragility in Nigeria, uh, leadership failure, and so on and so forth, as if the problem lies alone with leadership. Whereas for me, uh, I would want you to emphasize the role of the followers. Because without the followers, the leader has no business. Leadership is meaningful when there is followership. We can have followership without leadership. We cannot have leadership without followers. The, the concept of leadership is meaningful when there are followers. Meaning that the followers ha have a, a huge role to play. Uh, if our leaders are not doing it right, don't pass the buck, uh, the coming generation. No, you and I are also part of the problem and we should be part of the solution. Uh, saying that the uh, coming generation will solve Nigeria's problem or Africa's problem is uh, passing the buck. You and I are equal stakeholders and we must, again, learn from the very popular expression, no gain without pain. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to take... Um, Thank you very much. My uh, question is for the musician, <laughs> musicologist, <laughs> uh, artist. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you for for that paper. You were uh, the aspect that really attracted my attention is the fact that we most in most fields we try to use the Western standards to analyze African issues. And many a time, they don't apply. And you suggested that there should be standards and that there should be um, established, um, do I say calibrations? by which these are to be analyzed. But I didn't hear any suggestion as to how this could be done. Okay. Thank, you very Thank you. I'm going to take a third question, and then we are going to give the panelists a chance. To <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Tinola Nomadwagu from University of Lagos. Um, not in the music. Um, or the uh, art industry, but um, Joker's paper, I, I hope I'm right, has been quite an educative one, but I'm an educationist, and um, please correct me if I'm wrong. You made mention of the fact that you were able to compare um, the students at your own institution with the student of your um, pen, pencil film industry. And you made a statement that um, the performance of those at the Pence film um, institution were quite better than that of your university. Yeah, what we do now as an education is, is we move into the world, we move out into the actual place where it's been done because within the university, most of our lectures were based on theoretical aspects. Then as a lecturer or as a teacher, you know, those experience within the world, you are supposed to inculcate it into the university as, um, environment for your own students. Because education now has changed. The focus of education now is sustainability. There are a lot of graduates in the streets of Nigeria that do not have a job to do. So what we are trying to do now is to grant them, give them that education, whereby they can rely on themselves. They can you know, establish something. So what I'm trying to suggest, Joke, is that with your knowledge, with your practical experience, 
in pencils institution, you should be able to inculcate that practical aspect into the curriculum of your own university. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give uh, well, I quite appreciate the professor's, uh, professor from University of Ibadan's uh, contribution. Yeah, okay, so I, I appreciate his uh, contribution. But let me address some of his concerns. Uh, well, I apologize for not really uh, telling the, the audience the theoretical uh, groundings of this paper. Uh, it is social contract theory, but I did mention social contract in my you know, explanation. Um, let me correct an impression. You know, I'm the lead author of this paper. So when I say presenting on behalf of colleagues, it's not because I'm not familiar with the paper. I am the lead author. Okay. Having said that, um, you also mentioned no pay, no gain. You know, um, this paper is not passing the buck, you know, to the younger generation. I was born in Nigeria. I left Nigeria very early. Um, I grew up in Canada. I schooled in Canada. So, um, you know, I left the comfort zone in Canada to go back to Nigeria to contribute my own quota to the development of my people. So I'm experiencing pain, a lot of pain, because I left Canada at my prime. The current Canadian Prime Minister is my schoolmate, John Harper. But am I Nigeria's president? No. Do I, am I gonna be Nigeria's president in the future? Maybe not. Because, maybe yes. no, maybe not because because Jonathan has wasted the quota. I'm from the South South. And uh, you know that you know that in Nigeria it's all about zoning. He has wasted my own opportunity. So but anyway, I haven't been so pessimistic. I'm a realist. And you know, um, John Harper wasn't better than me in school. A lot of Nigerians or Africans in diaspora are better than Obama intellectually. But you see, we must be realistic, okay? This paper is looking at the disconnect, okay, between development, human rights, and good governance. We are the passengers, we are not the drivers. Why should you blame me for bad driving? The leaders are the drivers of African economy and, uh, you know, social, you know, whatever. They are, they are driving very badly. Accidents everywhere, social, political, and economic accidents everywhere, fatal ones. So you're not going to blame me for that. So this paper is is better on social contract theory. A contract means that two people are involved, two parties. I'm fulfilling my own obligation. I'm paying my taxes. So the the leaders we are doing that. That is why we voted Jonathan out of office. We're well, gone are the days where you have to carry guns and arms. And so we've used the power of our vote. We have spoken loudly and they've heard. So you see, we, we, we are not passing the buck. But then again, sorry, let me not take your time. You see, so we, we must uh, be very careful, you know, when we make general assumptions. The Nigerian youth, the Nigerian, I mean, the African, you know, uh, people have been so, you know, captured they have been so, um, you know, they are in captivity. So the only way we can free ourselves is to, you know, tell these people that they're not doing the right thing. But of course, there are obligations. When you're asking for rights, you must also, you know, give your own, uh, your own quota. And I think we are doing that. But it's not being appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to give Boja the chance to make a very quick and brief uh, comment. Let, from let me make a very quick and brief comment, adding to what um, Felix just said, and partly as a response to what the professor from Ibadan um, just mentioned. I'm uh, Bridget Tibor from the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth, and I, I, I think the issue of laying blame is something that we've, we've seen throughout the, the, um, the discussions. Yesterday we had one such discussion regarding you know, problems in Cameroon. And um, we also realize that our leadership represents the drivers. And if the leadership 
chooses not to do something, it's almost impossible for citizens or anybody else or opposition to do anything better. I gave the example yesterday of the Cameroonian head of state who was confronted with one of his ministers leaving the airport with a bag full of millions of dollars. He was picked up at the airport and the issue was channeled all the way to the presidency. And what was the response of the head of state? Meh, who's only proof? Meaning, where is your proof? What other proof can they be for somebody caught red-handed, leaving the country with a suitcase full of money? And you, as the leader, you are asking, where is the proof? And so I, I just wanted to say that as much as we, we talk about these things, it's not that people are not trying. People are doing everything they can. But if our leadership is inherently bad and irresponsible, then there's nothing much we can do. Take the case of Rwanda, for instance. The, the president of Rwanda, if he sees a beautiful big car in front of one of his cabinet minister's office, he goes out and he asks, who has this car? Because he knows that the salary of that person <laughs> cannot afford it. And not only do they fire that person on the spot, they repossess the car. And that is the kind of leadership that I think uh, Felix was referring to. They need to be responsible enough to take action so that it sends a message that this cannot be tolerated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bridget. We still have, I think there was one question for yeah, the musicologist. So yes. I want to uh, please um, very quickly, and then there was one for you. Um, yeah, we, we need to take at least one more set of questions. So please go ahead. OK, thank you very much. Um, the question for me is asking about I didn't mention suggestions to calibrations on African music. Um, well, I had very little time, and I was very conscious of um, the time limit, so I couldn't really exhaust the content of the paper. But I, I, had, I had something to say about that in the, in the paper. And I, I love the word you use, calibrations. I'm, I'm going to borrow it, because that's, that's the challenge we have in African music. Now, in European, Western stroke European classical music has um, um, developed over the years. Its scientists have formulated theories, scientific theories, with very good, let me use your word again, calibrations, with empirical calibrations, whereby they could explain the music. A lot of us in Africa learn this music, and we learn based on this um, 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 well spelled out calibrations. Now, the problem with Africans is that we Africans are saying these theories do not represent our music, which is right. These theories well, do not completely represent our music. My stand is this. Instead of throwing away the baby with the bathwater, why don't we, why don't we um, use this theory and adapt it? You see, I, 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 have a, I have a paper I'm trying to work on. It's, it's talking about the linguistic um, um, example. Yeah. Now, t talking about the, 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 the linguistic example for, for, for us in Africa, we didn't invent any set of alphabets. For example, in Yoruba land, we, we took from English alphabet, we adapted it to suit us, and that's how the literary world took off. So I tell my colleagues, instead of saying, Western theory does not explain our music. And I say, fine, don't let's throw away this Western theory. Let us understand the Western theory and let us see how we can adapt, adapt it to, yeah, modify to our, our own. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Thank you very much. Thank you for your response and for time management efforts. We are going to now move to the last uh, responses before I give the floor back to the audience. Okay, my own question. The first one is on um, the fact that most of the films, our films, Nollywood films, have predictability, right? And um, uh, my professor talks about membership in guilds and all that. Yes. Just like I discussed before that uh, training provides for sustainability, guild and membership provides for development and continuum in practice. Fine, yes. You will realize that there are so many uh, film directors 
while we have so many themes that are churned out. We have problems in, can, in terms of um, entertainment policy, content, yes. And the Nigerian, uh, the Nigerian government is not even helping matter in, in terms of census board. Most of the time, you watch films that are, that are not supposed to be watched by um, youngsters, and they'll still label it um, for, general. for general. Yes, we have Nigerian factor in terms of that. And uh, apart from that, despite the fact that we have films that have predictability, we have so many films that you cannot predict. You cannot say that because of that, uh, all the films have predictability. In all the films that I have done, if you watch me very well, you will know that all the films that I did, both in uh, WAP, both in even these Nollywood films, they do not have predictability, right? Most of the time, we have uh, writers that are not so trained. That is why I emphasize training here. It is very, very important. But then, they are very good. They are very, very good, right? So if they, if they can go for training, they will know how to develop the content and the form of the production. That is very, very important, right? And apart from that, we have a number of films that are being churned out every time, right? Saturation in the industry, which is not supposed to be so. And piracy is uh, digging deep into that to helping us to lose our jobs. So most of the time, the good ones will not produce. So when the good ones are not producing, all, uh, every Tom, Dick and Harry who wants to stars himself or, or herself to become stars, if they have a, a kind of a, well, either one or two million naira, they want to star themselves even though they don't have continuum. They don't have sustainability. You can al always see that. In films for uh, Wali Adenuga and uh, Tunde Kilani, you can see that those ones are different. But they are being frustrated every day because of pri uh, uh, piracy. Right. So we have a Nigerian factor that is drawing the hands of the clock back on that. But uh, overall, generally, we are still trying. It is not all the films that are predictable Can that I know. That is one. Yes, the second question is on uh, OOU, the curriculum for OOU and the for curriculum for pencils. Yes. You see, the problem is that uh, it is very unfortunate that um, performing art, drama, dramatic arts, are placed in four walls of a university. Because as a student, you must satisfy a, a, a particular unit before you can graduate. So for somebody who wants to major in acting, he or she comes into that discipline for the first time fully in 300 level. And even in that 300 level, she must do maybe um, four hours a week. Where, and she, he or she must go to other, other departments where he, she will take second department courses, third department courses. So uh, overall, in a session, or let's, let's say in a semester, he or she must pass about uh, nine courses. So for her to concentrate on that, it is a little bit difficult. But in the curriculum of acting itself, I try as much as possible because I teach in both places. I still see that it is still lacking in terms of practicals because you can't, some of the times they tell us that, look, you say we should be involved in practicals and all this. Yes, we are all other colleagues that are not doing practical courses. They are passing their courses more than those of us who are engaged in practicals because after two o'clock, they go for their practical uh, rehearsals and all that and eat deep. Then for, all, uh, for pencils, it is, it is uh, not so because they are not doing anything apart from acting for three months. That is it.